Hello! The next couple of months we are going to be doing some stories that were inspired by random writing prompts. What comes out is weird and wonderful and, of course, a little bit spooky. I hope you enjoy. The steel gray waves beat themselves against the rocks endlessly. The sound kept the new kids up all night. Devin was tired. The little ones were wearing on him. He was only 14, damn it. Why was he having to take care of two dozen children under the age of six? He shifted the gun to his lap and rubbed his eyes. There was no sense in sulking about it. As far as any of them knew, they and these children were the last people left on the New England coast, possibly even the entire Northeast. He couldn't allow himself to think about the possibility of it being worse. There had to be more people out there somewhere. The waves continued to pound, and the wind whipped the makeshift door so it snapped and rattled. The rain came down in sheets just like it had been since the night. It felt like it might never let up. Sandy came back two days ago with eight kids in tow. She was 16 and knew how to drive. She'd gone inland to see if she could get better supplies, maybe something to sleep on and some way to keep the rain out of the cave. Instead, she came back with more than half a dozen more mouths to feed. Most of these kids had never been near the ocean, and certainly not in a storm like this. The sound invaded their dreams, causing them to wake crying and screaming. As soon as they soothed one, another woke. Sandy, Abby, and James were in the cave now. They were doing their best to keep the kids quiet, but the addition of eight made it 24 children and four adults. Well, not even adults. Sandy was the oldest. James was only a year older than Devin at 15, and Abby was barely 13. The night it happened, they found each other while hiding in an abandoned house. It was barely standing when the weather was good, and it creaked and swayed in the storm alarmingly. They picked up the little kids the next morning. James went to see if he could find anyone else and came across the 16 kids, ranging in age from somewhere around two to five and a half. None of them knew each other except for two pairs of siblings. No one knew how they got there or where their parents were. Even though the sun should have been high in the sky, the thick clouds made it a perpetual twilight. The four teens found a safer place for themselves and the little kids. Each day, one of them went out and searched as far as they could get without seeing one of them. If you saw one, you had to head back to the most roundabout way possible. They didn't want to risk being followed. What were they? None of them knew. The first night, a sudden storm had blown in just as the sun went down. It was as bad as any hurricane, but the weather had said nothing about it. It alarmed people. But as experienced New Englanders, they went about their business. A little rain never stopped them. Devin and his parents had been at a local chain restaurant when the news cut in just as everyone's emergency alert went off on their phones. The restaurant was a cacophony of beeps and rings and the terrible alert tone on the televisions. The anchor never got to say a word. Just as the camera cut to her serious and well-cared-for face, it all went dark. Every light, every phone, every radio went silent. Devin's dad tossed some money on the table to pay the bill and stood up. You two stay here, he said. I'll bring the car around. Several people had the same idea, and it felt like half the restaurant tried to leave all at the same time. This made for a human traffic jam at the doors. The managers were yelling at the staff and the guests trying to get them to pay their bills in cash, and the staff were trying to make sure no one got hurt in the dark. No emergency lights came on. He heard the girl that sat them at their table tell the server that the backup generator should have kicked in by now. Devin's mother grabbed his arm and pulled him behind her, heading for the tangle at the door. He was too short to see much of anything in the press of bodies, but her fingers were digging into his arms so tightly they hurt. He pulled back and broke her grip for a moment and rubbed at it to get the circulation back. The press of people closed in and he could no longer see her. Then the sky lit up. It was not like lightning entirely, though there was a lot of that. It was like the floodlights on the football field and the blinding high beams of a big truck on a dark road and a carnival funhouse all at once. People gasped and shielded their eyes for a moment, but then the scream started. Somewhere near the front, a woman started shrieking and another joined her. People were now confused and the mass surged both forward and back at the same time as people tried to either get away from the door or get closer at the same time. 
Devon was tossed about like a human riptide. He had no idea where his mother was. Glass shattered and a high-pitched cry of something not even remotely human from the crowd. It was the instinct of a prey animal on sighting a predator. The moment of stillness broke into further chaos and Devon lost track of everything else. The next remotely coherent thought was sitting in that shack that was about to tear itself apart in the wind with three strangers. They all had similar stories and none had any idea if anyone else was alive. But the permanent storm and heavy rain kept them from getting a good look at the things. Devon's impression of them was something out of a Geiger nightmare, but others didn't seem to share his fascination with art and rolled their eyes. Abby said she had seen them in a game her brother played, said they were demons. Devon was pretty sure they were aliens. Not that it mattered. Whatever they were, they were killing people. A rustle to Devon's right made him freeze. None of them have seen a single animal since that night. Not even the always present seagulls. He squinted out into the gloom, kept his finger off the trigger until he was sure. His dad taught him that. Of course, he meant it for deer hunting with a rifle, not protecting preschoolers from aliens with a machine gun. Movement. Seen, not heard. He let off a quick burst of fire. The muzzle flashed in the gloom. They didn't have enough ammunition to play Rambo out here. He had to be sure if he was going to use it. The unearthly squeal came from the thick foliage. Devon opened up and sprayed the area with bullets. Caution be damned. The scream stopped. Kids started crying inside. James poked his head around the flap cautiously. His dark eyes were wide. Get him bundled up, Devon said shortly. They're too close. Time to move on. It's right there on the video. Carter covered his face with his hands and rubbed at it furiously. It definitely was. Plain as day, Mrs. Josephine Carmichael, known locally as Miss Josie, wrestling a large plastic wrap bundle into the trunk of her car. The same plastic wrap bundle her late husband Michael Carmichael was found in two days later. There's no mistaking it. Mr. Carmichael had died of blunt force trauma and a broken neck, consistent with a fall down a flight of stairs. That would have been easy enough to buy, but his body wasn't found at the bottom of a flight of stairs, is found half sunk in the mud near the lake. Suspicion always turns to the spouse, even when it's a sweet older woman like Miss Josie. It was no secret that as sweet as she was, her husband was just as mean. Well, Miss Josie volunteered at the library and the after-school program for kids that needed extra help or attention or the hours at the animal shelter, her husband was at his office screaming down a phone line at a contractor or a lawyer or some hapless employee who now had even odds of having a nervous breakdown. For all the time she spent trying to take hurt away from others, she hid hers under layers of makeup and pretty scarves. All the doctors in town knew she paid them to stay quiet about it. How could she have done this? Not the killing Michael. He deserved that. No one would fault her. But how did she make the mistake of being seen on camera? It was taken with her own surveillance cameras. If she pushed him down the stairs, why not leave him there? No one would question it. Almost half the town rejoiced at the news he was dead. We can't ignore this, Carter said sadly. No, his partner Jeff agreed. We can't. He stopped the playback and pulled out the tape. Despite their money, the Carmichaels had not updated their security system in a long while. The system was so old, Carter and Jeff had to sit in the basement of the police station where the only working VHS player lived. Is this the only one? Jeff asked. Carter nodded, too sunk in his own misery to ask why. Jeff placed the tape on the table and started digging around through drawers and cabinets. Carter watched him confused. Found it! Jeff declared, and held up something that looked for all the world like a cartoon caricature of a magnet. Its horseshoe shape even had the red and white paint. This is not who killed Roger Rabbit, Carter said, still not putting the pieces together. Nice reference, Jeff said with a grin. He picked up the VHS tape and ran the magnet around the surface several times. Put it back in, he said, handing it to Carter. Carter slid the tape back into the player. When he hit play, nothing but snow filled the screen. 
He forwarded and stopped several times in awe. Whoops-a-daisy, he said casually. What a shame. I guess we'll just have to live with the fate of Mr. Carmichael remaining a mystery. A tragic accident indeed, Carter agreed.